Okay, good morning. So we are ready to get our second day uh, started. We have Meng Chuan Tan from uh, NUS uh, Singapore. Uh, he'll tell us about, uh, yeah, he has the title on there. Yeah, long title. <laughs> okay. Take it away. All right. Uh, first and foremost, thank you very much for making it to the morning talk. It's, uh, uh, it's early for some of you, I guess. And I also, I would also like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this very nice place, Aswin in particular. It's been a very warm and friendly conference, and I think it's, it's very nice to be here. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, today I'm going to talk about, uh, as the title says here, a quasi-topological gauge sigma model. Okay, so quasi-topological in the sense that you have observables which are not just, you know, of conformal dimension zero, but you have conformal dimensions which are non-zero on the holomorphic side. So that's a quasi-topological model, it's something in between the physical string and the topological string. Okay, the physical string has excitations on both sides. Okay, massive excitations, you know, infinite house excitations, and this is something in between the topological string and the physical string. So I gauge it, okay, I gauge it, non-dynamically gauge it, I couple it to a background field. There is a purpose for doing that uh, because I eventually want to connect to some math theories that people have discovered, and from there, be able to connect to geometric Langlands correspondence as first formulated by Berlinson and Drinfeld. So the Langlands correspondence has uh, several incarnations. Okay, even in the math literature, there are various approaches that are eventually equivalent to realizing the geometric Langlands correspondence. So Ron told you a one approach yesterday, which was using Jacobian speaker line bundles, you know, local systems, pitching vibration, eventually leading to derived categories and mirror symmetry. And that's what uh, Kapustin and Witten sort of interpreted in terms of gauge theory. But Berlinson and Drinfeld, what they did was to use vertex algebras, color algebras, or algebraic conformal field theory. So algebraic conformal field theory is just a math version of our law of CFT in physics, okay? So they, that was the, sort of like the first formulation for geometric Langlands, and I'm gonna make contact with that. So the outstanding question that Kapustin and Witten had was, where is this connection to Berlinson and Drinfeld's formulation? Okay, and this, this is it. And I'll explain to you how I came to get those ideas to work on this thing. And through this model, we would be able to also link or connect to the story of knots and some conjectures by people like Paul Seidel and Smith, you know, which relates Kovanov homology to Lagrangian intersection flow homology. Okay, so we can, we can, and that's something which you can't see from the gauge theoretic point of view. Well, you can eventually, I mean, looking at the evidence here, and if you go back to look at the gauge theory and consider the correct setup, you would be able to derive it, but offhand, that was something that was not obvious, not obvious from gauge theoretic point of view. Okay, so if you get lost along the way, that's what I'm gonna do today. Okay, right, let's continue. So the scope of the presentation will be such, we all first give an introduction of the relevant works that led to this presentation. And of course, the motivation, which I already told you a little bit about. And since there are both physicists and mathematicians in, in the audience, I'll give some background requirements on what you ought to know if you want to understand those papers in detail. You don't exactly need to know them in this talk. You know, I've left out you know, some gory details you know, in, in, in favor of you know, clarity and, and brevity. So if you have any uh, questions, you could always ask me offline. I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. And then I'll summarize the main results. Again, in case you lose track, you will know what to look out for. And then I'll go into a detailed explanation of the main results, and then I'll conclude, All right? Okay, so this uh, talk today is actually based on a, well, in physics context, this is pretty old. Okay, but I, I, I decided that maybe I should, you know, talk about this at this conference because uh, the theme was geometric Langlands, it was about field theories, you know, not, so I had something to say about these things, and that's why I decided to speak about it. The other reason why I decided to speak about it is that the gauge theoretic approach to Langlands is very well known, okay, but this is less well known, and I believe this deserves attention too, so that's why I'm introducing this to you. So it's built on the insights of these papers, okay, so these two papers of my, well, they're all my papers, actually. So uh, these were my PhD thesis papers, actually, okay? So they generalized the story by Witten. So there was this founding paper, 0, 0,2, Perturbative Aspects, where he studied 
uh, a 0, 0,2 sigma model with only right-moving fermions, with no left-moving fermions. And he showed you know, that that model had some interesting features, a color algebra, an affine algebra of critical level. Okay, so what I did was to generalize that story to you know, all sorts of, of sigma models. Heterotic sigma models, 2,2, 4,4, 4, mirror symmetry, and all that. So this is in here. And then I studied the gauge version in here. Okay, And then I studied instantons in here. Um, and then eventually I, I, okay, these three are somewhat related. This is something different. This is donaldson witten theory with surface operators, but it tells you something about knots. And that's where I sort of got insights to connect the sigma model to the uh, uh, story of knots too. Okay, so, right, so the motivation for this work, which leads to this talk, is to first furnish a physical interpretation of the recently formulated mathematical theory of twisted chiral differential operators. Okay, so it's twisted in the sense that, okay, um, well, chiral differential operators physically it just means it's a beta gamma BC system, it's a ghost system, okay? Right, so you know how to write Lagrangian for the BC beta gamma system, okay? So for the math people, it's uh, color differential operators are like sort of a, a refinement of regular cohomology. They are like differential forms that have higher sort of uh, differentials, like you know, uh, that they 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 have a uh, higher derivatives in this z parameter, where this z parameter is something that you can associate with the Riemann surface, okay? So that's what color differential operators are. Sorry? Is that holomorphic differential? That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So if you look at the old work here, so this was just usual chiral differential operator, so it's not twisted. And later on, okay, there was a twisted theory that was being formulated by Arakawa, Malikov, Gorbanov, and Scheidman. So these guys. And the reason why I saw that it was interesting to sort of find a physical interpretation of that was that when I was at the IS as a postdoc in 2007, I asked Witten, you know, um, why didn't he continue to work on 0, 0,2 to formulate geometric Langlands and connect with Belinsen and Dreamfeld's story? And he told me that he had the affine algebra at a critical level, that was crucial, but he had no way of controlling that algebra, meaning that there was no parameter to vary in. And as, and as such, he couldn't physically construct the eigensheaths over Bungie. Okay, bungee, modular space of G bundles, okay. So, and then when I saw what these guys did, so twisted here just means that, you know, over the intersections and how they transform over overlaps, they don't close to identity. Twisted in the sense of, like, mathematical twisted, the bundle. Okay, there's some kind of uh, non-closure of the triple intersections. Okay, the transition functions over triple intersections, they don't close, they come to something. And these chiral differential operators here have a parameter that can be controlled. So in other words, if I find a physical interpretation of this theory, it would mean I would have an affine algebra at a critical level which had a parameter inside that I could control. And that would mean that I would be able to do you know, what Witten had been able to do with, with this single model that he, that he, that he studied in, zero, uh, in 2005. Okay, so that led me to sort of study this uh, model here. Okay, so it has to be different from the one that we didn't study, of course. It has to be a gauge version of that. And the background field in the gauge, in the non-dynamically gauge sigma model, uh, that's the parameter that we're talking about that you can control. So this would not be the Hitchin sigma model? Oh, no, 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 it's not. it's not. Yes. So the Hitchin sigma model, that appears in the mirror symmetric manifestation of Langlands, Hitchin vibration, mirror to another Hitchin vibration using SYZ, so major is also duality on the torus fibers, and then you get G to LG of Hitchin system. Okay, so that's not. What he's mentioning about sigma models in the, uh, with target space of Hitchin system, that comes from gauge theory, on which you compactify on a Riemann surface, and that gauge theory, you know, gets symmetry spontaneously broken, it becomes a sigma model, it becomes a topological sigma model. This is quasi-topological. And that's a 4,4 topological sigma model. This is a 0,2 quasi-topological signal model, totally different things. Okay, so, yeah, so that approach is the gauge theoretic approach. And in that approach, you have, you know, in that Kapustin and Witten approach, which Ron wanted to talk about, I'll say a little bit now, since we're all on this topic. So that's, you know, you have sigma models, which are 4,4 with Hitchin 
uh, moduli space as the target space of the, the sigma model, and you had brains. They were open sigma models. This is closed. So you had A brains on one side being Lagrangian submanifolds, being the D modules, and then on the mirror side, you had the B brains, and then a point on it is just like this dual G bundle over Riemann surface. Okay, so that's the gauge theoretic story. And that sort of interprets um, what Tadeus, Housel, I guess Ron, maybe Pantev, and those people were studying using Hitchin vibrations and the mirror symmetry. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't sort of address what Berlinson and Drinfeld does. Or did, okay. So, um, yeah, and this will address that. Okay, so we finish a physical interpretation of this very interesting mathematical theory, and you will see a very nice interplay of physics with the math results. So the anomalies and all that. I won't be able to cover everything, but it's, it's a beautiful story. Uh, just, just to give you a little flavor, like, you know, in physics, we have anomalies of sigma models. So how do they arise? You quantize the theory, you put an action in the path in the grow, and then you do some transformation. The action, the classical action remains invariant, but the measure doesn't the measure the path in the grow that picks up a face. And you could count using an index theorem of the zero modes or that con contribute to the phase. And then you have some anomaly cancellation condition in terms of cohomology classes. Could be first churn class, Pontryagin class, and all those things. So that's the physics way of understanding anomalies. Now, if we formulate the physical sigma model in terms of, you know, this hydro differential operators, what we're doing is that we need to glue the sigma model. So we have a sigma model that's defined on some local patch in the target space, and you start gluing them. You glue them geometrically, you glue them quantum field theoretically using the symmetries of the sigma model on each patch. And then when you find an obstruction to gluing, that obstruction is exactly that cohomology class, that, that, that first churn class, first Pontryagin class. So you get a different understanding of anomalies as the inability to glue you know, these physical theories together on the entire target space X. So you don't see it from the point of view of the non-invariance of the path integral measure, but you see it from this very, in fact, it's very intuitive, right? Physically even more intuitive than, than just seeing that the measure is in, not, not invariant under transformations of chiral symmetries, for example, right? So, so this is the very interesting part. And you get to see, and I'll show, okay, even the one-loop beta function, which spoils conformal invariance, okay? that can also be understood in terms of these sheaves and their inability to sort of glue correctly across intersections. Okay, so that's this part here. Okay, so explaining how this will enable us to actually have an affine algebra that can be controlled by some parameter that leads us to the next motivation, okay, to furnish an alternative non-gauge theoretic physical interpretation of the geometric Langlands correspondence so as to be able to make contact with the original formulation by Berlinson and Brimfeld, which utilizes algebraic CFT, but that's algebras, car algebras, okay. And from the physics, okay, gain some mathematical insights about the correspondence at genus one and zero, which were not addressed in the gauge theoretic approach by Kapustin and Witten. There is a genus one and zero correspondence that involves the Hitchin system at genus zero and one, which is the Gaudin model, and then the Kalajuro motor uh, system, okay? So at genus zero and one, you need punctures, you need parabolic structures, otherwise the moduli space would collapse to zero, okay, if I remember correctly, okay? So, and we are able to actually also understand this from the physics. All right, okay, so that we would, okay. Why, why do you say that? that Oh, because they assume genus two and above. Oh, but you could take like Gukov Witten style and just add. Ah, uh, right. Once you take uh, Gukov Witten, then you can go lower. Okay. Yeah, because only the the bundles um, uh, at lower genera you need to have punctures. Yeah. Okay. So okay, so this is one motivation. Okay. The second motivation is. There are some conjectures, you know, which relate geometric Langlands to knots. Okay, uh, so we would be able to sort of find some physical proofs, very nice physical proofs of that. Okay, so, and then of course there are also some conjectures relating quantum groups to the correspondence. 
once you have knots, quantum groups are natural. Okay, so in some sense, it's sort of systematic to say how the correspondence can, can also be related to quantum groups. So this was done here by Gates Gorey. Okay, so at some, some, time, some time back, four, four years ago maybe, yeah. And then here you have things, uh, this conjecture by Seidel and Smith. Okay. All right, background requirements for the mathematician. So if you want to understand those series of papers and eventually that main paper, which will allow you to understand the details of this talk, uh, well, 2D supersymmetry and super conformal field theory. This, so this is not class field theory. This super conformal field theory. I'm a physicist, so it's SCFT here. Twisted sigma model. So what's this twisted? Now this twisted is different from the math twisted. Math twisted, as I explained, was the bundle twisting over you know, transition functions over triple overlaps. You don't get one and something, something else. This twisted means topological twisting, which means that you redefine the spin generators of the quantum field theory to be shifted by this thing called the R charge of the field. So it's a prescription to allow you to convert some of the superchargers, the supersymmetries, which are spinners, to become scalars and vectors. So we don't want to look at the vectors, we just want to look at the scalars. So scalars, well, they have no direction, so they survive any geometry. So if you look at the, the spectrum that's associated with this scalar supercharge, in particular, we are looking at the Q-cohomology because the spectrum just so happens to be captured by the Q-cohomology, something that's Q-close, but that's not Q-exact, that happens to be the thing we are looking for. And then it becomes, it is topological in this sense. Okay, so this is Twisted Sigma model, and then anomalies I mentioned just now, the inconsistency of, of a physical theory, and then current algebra. Current algebra is just affine algebra. Okay, world sheet instantons. Okay, I won't, I won't be talking about the world sheet instantons today, but in the paper you will see it. Uh, so world sheet instantons are basically these classical configurations whereby strings, when they're mapped to a target space, they can actually wrap a two-cycle and sort of get frozen in space and time there. So instantons, that's what it means. Okay, there are solitons which are frozen in space, but they traverse in time. But instantons just appear at one point in space and time, so at instant. So you have these configurations in string theory whereby the, the wall sheets actually wrap, you know, some two cycles in some space, some point in space and time. Okay, so and these have very very interesting um, ramifications. I mean, percussions, or I mean, implications. Gromov-Wooten theory. It's basically a theory, physical theory of Walsh and Isentons, okay, on one side. And then, of course, we need to know a little bit about supersymmetric quantum mechanics. Now, why does this even come in? So, if you look at a sigma model, if you look at a wall sheet of a sigma model being a cylinder, okay, it's actually a line cross a loop. So, and this sigma model uh, consists of maps from this cylinder to some space x. So an alternative perspective that one can take to understand this physical model is to think of it as a line that maps to the loop space. So that's where supersymmetric quantum mechanics comes in because you started with a supersymmetric sigma model and then you look at it from this point of view as it not being a world sheet but a point particle, then it becomes a supersymmetric quantum mechanical system. And there, are, there is value to actually looking at it from this point of view because you can say things about loop space. For example, the spectrum of the sigma model, which I said was part of the Q cohomology, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between that spectrum and harmonic spinners on the space. So if you look at it from the point of view of supersymmetric quantum mechanics, you can understand or say some things about harmonic spinners on loop space. So that's the value add in some sense for, for, for math people, okay? And then we must sort of have some acquaintance with WZW models and Chen Simon's theory. So WZW models are, are basically two-dimensional conformal field theories, and they are um, sort of the holographic dual, okay, this is the first instance of holographic dual uh, of a 3D Chen Simon's theory. So if you take a 3D Chen Simon's theory on a three manifold and it has a boundary, on the boundary itself is a WZW model, okay? So this is topological, this is conformal. So that's quite interesting. Do you need them for non-compact judgment? 
Uh, so we'll, eventually when we come to this part, we'll be looking at the, at the compact one. Compact yeah, compact age groups, not the complex one, so the real one. Yes. Because to define this for the non-compact one is a bit tricky. Okay. Yeah. That's the whole industry of the analytic continuation that Witten did and all those things, finding the uh, integration cycle and all that so that it converges. But if it's a real group, then that's okay. Yeah. Okay. So, and now for the physicists, all right, so basically just read Nakahara. Okay, so most of the stuff is in Nakahara. Okay, so this is what you sort of need to know a little bit. Okay, this is, this is a bit more sophisticated beyond Nakahara, so Griffith and Harris would be a good book to start, I think. Okay, that's most palatable to physicists because it's less abstract. Okay, and then this one here, representation theory, I mean, there are many good books on that. Uh, there's group extensions, maybe there's this uh, textbook on Lie algebra and Lie groups uh, that you can find. I can't remember the name of the guy, it's a Polish guy. So elliptic genera, which is essentially just the partition function of a half excited string, okay? And then some acquaintance with knots, knot homology and, and stuff like that. Okay, that's cool. All right, so summary of the main results. Okay, so we first study the physical features of a non-dynamically gauge quasi-topological. I'll explain how, in what sense, it's quasi-topological, okay? Uh, more clearly, 0, 0,2 sigma model with target a G-manifold in perturbation theory. So no instant transfers. We just consider the zero mode to be a constant map, you know, from the world sheet onto the target space, okay? So the scalar fields are just world sheet maps, are maps from the world sheet into target space, okay? You could see it as a degree zero instanton, Gauche instanton. Okay, G manifold is just a manifold which has a G isometry, so a G action that acts on it, and it results in an in a isometry of the manifold. Okay, so once you have a target that is a G manifold, it means that this symmetry of the target will be inherited on the Wolschian, and that's where we can gauge the Wolschian. All right, and couple the vector fields that generate the G isometry onto the Wolschian. Okay, so that's, that's why we, we are defining the target to be some G manifold. So flag manifolds, for example, we can study those things. Okay, we can gauge it by uh, some subgroup of G. Okay, so we will see its quasi-topological model. I'll explain these details. Now the inv invariant Noir scalings of the row sheet. In other words, if you compute the trace of the stress tensor, it vanishes. Okay, the ZZ bar one. And then there is a conformal anomaly, unless the target space is richly flat. Of course, this is a quantum quantum statement anomaly comes about when you look at the quantum theory, and you would see that some of this, 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 this thing is uh, conformal invariance is violated unless the target space is Ricci flat. Yeah. Is it's hard to come up uh, uh, with Ricci flat. Uh, yeah, right, exactly. Right, exactly. So that's exactly what we need for the geometric Langlands correspondence, an anomalous theory. Uh -oh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We want an anomalous one. <laughs> That's the thing. That's the thing, right? So flag manifolds, for example, anomalous. But that will give you the current algebra at critical level. Yeah, that's why I mean critical level current algebra. That's that's not something that's in some sense physically sensible, if you will. But you know that gives us what we want to to, to use to formulate geometric angles. Okay, uh, in the context of Berlinson and Drinfeld. Okay, and as I mentioned earlier on, we have an infinite tower of excited states that have holomorphic weights, so it's excited only on one side, so you could think of it as a chiral spectrum, okay? Right, and of course, if you have excitations on one side, you can always define elliptic genus, and it's therefore non-trivial. So the operator observables, they also span a holomorphic chiral algebra, which I will explain how this comes about. And if you look at the purely ground operators, meaning the ones with conformal dimension zero, then they just exhibit the same kind of topological chiral ring that you see in topological sigma models, naturally. So the point here is that this quasi-topological model encapsulates the topological model. The topological model is just a subsector of the quasi-topological model. It's just a ground state sector of the, the quasi-topological model, right? So that's the interesting thing. So there are more things that we can explore mathematically you know, like a higher, more refined version of mirror symmetry, if you will, of Gromov with an invariance, but a higher version of that. So that's not been done. We could think about it. Okay. Um, okay, and because they are not the same as the topological sigma model observables, which can be described by Dirac or Dobok homology, 
they need to be described by something more abstract and more general, a check cohomology group. Okay. Which eventually, again, specialized to ground state or conformal dimension zero operators will reduce to DRAM or the wall. Okay, so, and then if we, cho if we choose the gauge group to be the katan, okay, of, uh, of the, the, the G manifold, okay, and the target space is a flag manifold of G, then our sigma model physically manifests the mathematical theory of twisted chiral differential operators. And that's what we need in the physical formulation of Berlinson and Dreamfeld's approach to geometric lengths. Okay, so this is, this is the thing which, yeah, uh, this is anomalous. Flag manifolds are uh, yeah, not Ricci flat. Okay, so after we do that, then we play with the model a little bit more. So we take the target space to be infinite. Flag manifolds in general are Taylor, so you could have taken a 2 2. Yeah, you could. You could. You could. But you prefer treating that as a 0 2 matter? Or? Yes, yes, yes. Because we want that. Oh, wow. Well, okay, we want that. Uh, FN algebra at critical level. If we had chosen a 2 comma 2 model, it wouldn't be a critical level. Yeah. Okay, so maybe you will explain how that. Yeah, 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 right, yeah. So the point is that if we had chosen any other kind of uh, model, 2 comma 2, you know, 4, 0, 0 comma 4, or, you know, we won't get the FN algebra at critical level, right? And we won't be able to connect to this uh, twisted differential operator, twisted power differential operators. Yeah. And so far, everything you have seems very local. You have not incorporated a Riemann surface. Oh yes, you'll see later on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's you see because these these operators that they are talking about, even in the topological sigma model, they're local operators where you insert it at some point on the Riemann surface. Yeah. So that's why we are just talking about. But it works. You know. Um, I mean, there are some obstructions. You know. But if you satisfy those. Conditions they can be physically defined, yeah. Okay. So okay, so if we start to take the, the the target space to be infinitely large, you know, so what happens is this: when when it's infinitely large, or alternatively, you could see it as looking at the sigma model over a local patch on the target space, because that's also isomorphic to R n, right? And you see that the model actually possesses a generalized T duality. So it has a symmetry, a t-duality, right? Now, and from this t-duality, we can look at the chiral algebra of this sigma model and derive an isomorphism of W algebras. So an, a W algebra lives on the worksheet also. Okay, it's a symmetry of that theory. Okay, I mean, once you have affine algebras, you know, you use the Sugawara construction, you can define these higher W algebras from it. And they would still be in the Q cohomology, or in other words, the chiral algebra. And then you would have, you know, an isomorphism, okay, of W algebras, whereby the level of the W algebra is, in some sense, an inverse of the other. So it's the Feigen Frankel sort of isomorphism. I, I don't know, these two guys are math, math guys, and that's the basis with which Berlinson and Drinfeld used to sort of formulate their version of geometric language using chiral algebras and vertex algebras. Okay, yeah. Can you still hold me at the back? It's okay? Yeah. Okay, so now, of course, our model is not the infinite volume limit. We've got to bring it back down to a finite volume limit. And when we bring it back down to the finite volume limit, we get exactly what is the classical Langlands duality. So this is a terminology which I'll clarify. The quantum Langlands duality of W algebras is one whereby the level is not restricted to be critical, okay? And then that reduces to the specific case of the classical Langlands duality, where the level is critical on one side and it's infinite on the other side, okay? So then that gives you sort of the statement that for every LG bundle on a Riemann surface, you have a D module on band G, the most down-to-earth statement about the Langlands correspondence and not the categorical one where the quantum Langlands correspondence is, is more, is, is no, the more correct way to see the categorical sort of formulation. Okay, right. So, and then if you reduce to a finite world volume, a finite target space limit, you get this thing, very nice, very good. So, because we have this now, then it's 
just, you know, quite straightforward for us to have a physical interpretation of the Langlands correspondence for G, where the complex curve is the worksheet of the sigma model itself. Okay, I'll explain how this is done. It's close to sort of the approach that Berlinson and Riffel took to define conformal blocks, you know, as hacker eigensheaves, and then exponentiating the current generators on the world sheet to define LG bundles, same kind of thing going on. And then using the relation to opus. Opus are essentially like a data of a, a bundle with a connection on some curve, right? So, and that's associated to some classical W algebra. So, so Frankel and Feigen, they, they studied this to death uh, in the 90s. Okay, so we will see that correlation functions of certain purely bosonic operators are hacker eigen sheaves. We have, yeah. Yeah, right. So, you. The function become a sheaf. Yeah, no, it's a correlation function. So, it's a value that varies over bungee. And it has, and it has, uh, it has, it has, uh, there are line operators on which you can act on the correlation functions, and they give you the properties that they would transform like, like a, a hacker eigen sheaf. So the details are in the paper, uh, I, we can discuss, yeah. So in Berlinson and Dreamfeld's uh, formulation of... The correlation of, function is something derived from the eigenfields, okay? No, no. The, the correlation functions are something in the physical theory. But they have an interpretation, you know, in that sense. Yeah. Something as a, as a sheaf on, on, the, on bungee. So Berlinson and Dreamfeld, what they did was something similar. They used, you know, color algebras and vertex algebras, defined these correlation functions of the theory, but in a formal kind of way. And it has some kind of uh, abstract formal mathematical map between these things and then into Hecker eigenschiefs. So what we have here is a physical way of seeing this, these formal maps that they have defined. Yeah. Isn't the statement that the D module that balance in general for the is some algebraic geometry where it's getting differential equations for yeah. some yes. correlation function. Yeah, that's right. So we have that also. We will have differential equations. So if you look at, for example, people like Tashner, he had something like this also, correlation functions, differential operators acting on it, with some eigenvalues being some differential form of degree SI, something like that. Yeah, we have we have that also, you know. So yeah. Okay, right. So we have these non-local operators also, these line operators on which we can act on the correlation functions and then get some transformation, which results in a hacky modification. Okay. Okay, we won't have time to talk about these things, so pretty much I'll, I'll just keep talking about it. But the point is that we also have a physical understanding of why there can be no hacker eigen sheaves at genus zero with less than three punctures. For reasons that I mentioned just now, we need punctures on the curve if we want to have a non-vanishing moduli space. Okay, so that this you can understand it from the point of view of worksheet in some corrections. Yeah. Yes, sure. So the last point. Yes. Is that straightforward from your purely dimensional? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you can look at the paper. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. for Kapustin, we think that part of the argument was sort of necessarily from four dimensions. That's right. They considered like 4D line operators, you know, acting on the boundaries of those, the 4D, the brains, and then transforming in that, in that, that way with hacker modification. Yeah. So the, the, the point is that, you know, that Langlands itself, the correspondence manifests itself in, in many different ways, and this is one of the less known ways that it manifests. Okay, so, all right, so the point is that this one we can understand in terms of Walsh and Santons and we can connect it to this conjecture by Hans Stotz, which says that there are no harmonic spinners on flag manifolds of G. Okay. So I won't have time to go through this. It's in the paper. You could ask me if you want. I'll be more than happy to explain it to you. Uh, hopefully I'll remember all the details. Okay, it's been seven years, but I should be able to remember. Okay, right. And then we continue to see the connections to knots. Okay, can you see the connections to knots? All right, and in the infinite volume limit, the nice thing is that we realize that the 2D Lagrangian can exactly be rewritten as a WZW model for G, compact G, okay? And through the connections of WZW with Chen Simons and with knots, we can connect 
the correlation functions and therefore the D modules to the knots. Okay? And then we can say things about the knots and its connection to Langlands from the T duality that we have of the W algebras on the Wolf sheet. Okay. And as a result, we would be able to sort of, you know, give a physical interpretation of some conjectures by Gates Gory, okay, which relates ramified D modules to quantum groups and such. Okay, and, and also by Seidel and Smith, yeah, this, this is a very interesting conjecture. You have Kovanov homology on one side, and then you have Lagrangian intersection, Lagrangian intersection flow, flow homology on the other side. So that's, that's interesting. Okay, right, so the physics. So what is the statement of the second? Ah, right, so you have Kovanov homology, like some index which computes the Kovanov, like some, some weighted count of the Kovanov homology dimensions of the vector space defined by Kovanov, okay, on one side. And then on the other side, it involves uh, this, the homology for the, this uh, Lagrangian intersection flow homology. So you're counting, you're counting with signs the number of points where Lagrangian submanifolds intersect. Uh, Lagrangian submanifolds are? Yes, correct. So, uh, so he was just conjecturing it for some space which he couldn't figure out what it was. Oh. So now we see it's the Hitchin moduli space through this thing. Yeah. So, yeah, syntactic manifold, yes, but, you know, so we see it from our work that is the Hitchin moduli space. And if, and in, in the paper, which is the basis of this talk, I did an analysis of the Kapustin and Witten story to prove that through Witten Kapustin, uh, you, you can do that too. So, one of the reasons, I mean, why Witten and Kapustin probably didn't, didn't, you know, sort of take this excursion to prove that was perhaps you know, it wasn't obvious from that point of view that you could do that, but now that we've seen it from this point of view, that it's possible. You go back to the gauge theoretic formulation, you, you will be able to prove it using the gauge theoretic formulation too. Okay, so I have half an hour left, I, I, but I think it was important that I just spelled out all these things in case you're lost in the details. Okay, so here are the details. I'll just go through it uh, quickly, okay. What happened here? Oh, time out for me? No. Okay. Okay. Right, so the sigma model looks like that. It's very simple. It's a 0, 0,2 model with no right moving fermions, uh, no left moving fermions. So it's, it's, a, it's a truncated version of the heterotic string. And so it doesn't have the four Fermi term either. It's a very, very simple model, but it's a very, it gives us many insights, okay? So the difference now is this, we gauge it non-dynamically, so you don't see a gauge field strength, okay? But then you have a gauge field that's sitting inside here. This is a covariant derivative. This is also, this is, a, this is Christoffel connection and covariant uh, NA, okay? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't put it here, okay, yeah, right. Yeah, so it's, it's here, there's a Christoffel connection here, right? Okay, can you see that? Now these are vector fields generating the GR geometry of the target space. So they, they get inherited under the Wolschian. Okay, so it, and then they obey these rules, the usual rules of the vector fields, and the lead drag and all those things. So these are just details. Okay, and so you can do a gauge transformation, okay? Transform the fields this way, and, and this way, and this way, and then the Lagrangian is invariant. All right, so these are coordinates of the target space, and therefore they will transform in this way. Okay, and these are tangent vectors of the target space and they will transform in this way. Okay, so the nice thing is that you could rewrite this guy here as in this form. Okay, whereby this guy has these transformation uh, rules of the fields. Now this model is already twisted. If you notice that this Spinner here is actually a scalar. It's got no index on the world sheet. Now this guy here is a one form already, a zero comma one form, it's a z-bar index. So it's twisted, okay? Which then means that this supercharge now is a scalar, okay? So we have this, you do a, so this bracket here for math guys is just, it just means a variation of, of these things, yeah, according to these rules, and then you reproduce this. Okay, so and then you can compute the stress 
components of the stress tensor, okay, like for example, this is the trace, which is essentially the variation of S with respect to the different components of the metric on the worksheet. GZZ, GZ bar Z bar, Z bar Z. And then you get these components and you realize it's zero. Okay, this is the part where the quasi topological is important. So, and then you compute TZZ bar, it's written in a Q exact kind of way. Now, now this guy, this guy is not Q exact. Now, in a typical topological model, this guy would also be written in a Q exact form. So, if you're looking at the spectrum of Q cohomology, any transformation that's affected by, by this guy would be now, okay? And if it was a topological model, and if this was Q exact, then this would be now too. So then it would mean that any metric deformation of, in any way, you know, would be now in the Q cohomology, and therefore it is fully topological. But in this case, it's only now with respect to these transformations, but not now with respect to this. So that's, in that sense, it's quasi-topological, okay? And if you compute this guy, it's also zero on shell. Okay, this is a classical expression. It's to be corrected, okay? And it tells you that, you know, if you effect this transformation on a field, okay, it takes an operator. It takes one operator to another operator, which is still annihilated by Q. So you still have operators which are in the Q cohomology when you have the holomorphic stress tensor transformations on, on them, okay? Okay, so, and then from these things here, from these expressions here, you can deduce these things. Okay, this is, so this is just, you know, from here. Okay, so this guy is expanded in Lorentz modes of L bar. And if you take the residue, then you see that its zeroth mode will also look like this way. Now, if you consider an operator that is Q closed, that's what we want, a Q cohomology. So, then you can see that this expression where you act this on this guy can be written in this way, okay? You can try, you know, you put a Q, you put this guy inside here and this guy will act on this, which will annihilate it and then it will just go over to the other. So you can see that the L0 bar on some operator is Q exact, but we, we know in principle, this gives you the eigenvalue, okay, of the anti-holomorphic spin or conformal dimension of you know, the operator. And so you can see that the anti-holomorphic dimension of the operator must be zero, must be now in Q cohomology. Okay, so that's, that's how we have anti-holomorphic conformal weights are zero in Q cohomology. So we only have holomorphic weights uh, on one side. Okay, so you have infinite power of local operators with positive holomorphic conformal weights in Q cohomology. Okay, so this is where it's different from a topological model. Okay, then you can do some, some other things, uh, you know, analyze this. Okay, I'm running on short of time, so. Okay, and then you can, this is again derived from the fact that TZ bar Z bar is cube exact, and then you can see that when you act, you know, with this uh, anti-holomorphic differential, you get a Q exact term again, which means that the algebra is holomorphic. It will only depend on Z and not Z bar. Observables are holomorphic, okay, right. Right, so now if you study the model quantum mechanically, right, with corrections, then remember we had this being zero, right, just now, but now it's not zero, okay? So because the action gets corrected and then the action of this, this uh, Q variation of this guy gets something else. So you can see that it will still be zero if it's Ricci flat. Right, this is where, this is what we call the conformal anomaly, okay? Right, so because if this is not zero on this side, it means that when this field, when this operator acts on the local observables, it transforms it out of the Q cohomology. And so if we make it Ricci flat, then you know this is okay. And we still have the same property that we saw just now. Okay, so well, I'll just be fast. Uh, the point is that, okay, we've seen just now that L0 bar equals a zero, and operators remain in the Q cohomology after you have this action on it. Okay, it's not so important. Okay, so as we saw just now, okay, never mind the details here, I'll just go a bit fast. So the, 
the, the observables, the physical observables, they are holomorphic in Z. So if you multiply them together, they would have this kind of current algebra structure. Okay, this is a quantum field theoretic statement. Okay, this is actually something that you take in, you know, it's a uh, correlation function actually. Okay. So, okay, right? Okay, never mind. This this tells you that okay. So and quantum mechanically, this gets corrected, but it's still Q exact. Okay, so things are still fine. It's still invariant under scalings. Okay. Now, so what do the operators look like explicitly? So they look like this. Okay, so they look like this. So you can have composites of the fields. But now the difference between the topological model and the this quasi topological one is that you can have higher derivatives in Z, but only in Z. Because remember, we only have holomorphic rates. Okay, so it's only in Z, and then of course we have this, and then we can have psi i, bar. We don't have the other one, because if you remember, that guy was in Z bar. The psi was in Z bar, so we can't have operators which have anti-holomorphic conformal dimensions. So uh, psi Z bar is not allowed, okay? Yeah, I have not come. Uh, Right. Then you have to glue them. Yes. Yes. Right. 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 Okay. Right. That's right. So you have a local sheaf, and you want to define a bigger. I mean, the whole model itself. Then you have to glue the sheaves. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. This is still local. So yeah, the algebra is still with respect to a local sheaf. So one small, small open subset of the target space. So when you glue them, then it becomes something different. Yeah, but you could glue the chiral algebras, you could. Meaning that you have this relationship that you saw just now on one patch. Then if you want to make it into a bigger sheaf and glue in, you glue in the second one, then you would have to transform those relationships that you see, those, those relations that you see, you know, using some transformations, and then you get a different chiral algebra. So you could glue the chiral algebras also. That's right. So you have to, we have to, we have to sort of, uh, we have to glue in conditions. So I'll tell you how to glue them. It's, it's a very nice picture. Okay, so we have these things. So you can see that the operators themselves, they look like essentially, okay, in the typical, you know, so in topological field theory, this is, this is like a, a zero comma k differential form on a target space, okay? So now we have these guys, these complications here, you know, with uh, higher derivatives in Z and all that, okay? And so we can see it as zero k forms on x value in some certain sum of vector bundles. Okay. Now, so generally the local operator is not invariant under gauge transformations because if you transform the a inside here or a inside here, they will become something different. But nonetheless, the transform operator remains q close. Okay, it's u1 r charge is the same as before. Okay, I'm afraid I have to speed up. I mean, for the math people who don't understand these terms, uh, please bear with me. I, I will emphasize the main ideas. Uh, uh, so if you want to know more, you could ask me. So the URR charge is the same as before. So we can in interpret the gauge transformation as a change in the basis of the space of operators. Okay, they're still in Q cohomology. They just become like, you know, the other members in the Q cohomology. Okay, so we will be able to see this in the gauge, uh, supersymmetric gauge quantum mechanics picture, which I won't discuss, but, uh, yeah, it's in the paper. So we have a chiral ring, okay? So I'll just go a bit fast, okay? It's, you can deduce that the ground state operators will eventually have this ring here whereby they are independent of the insertion points, okay? So this is pretty much a well-known story. So in general, we have an OPE that looks like this, which conserves R charge and conformal dimension. So this is the conformal dimension of A, conformal dimension of B, and then that of C here, but if these two are zero conformal dimension, then this would be this. If you group this as a single operator, it's also conformal dimension zero. And conformal dimension zero operators, uh, which are holomorphic, are just holomorphic functions. Holomorphic functions on compact Riemann surfaces are constants, so they're independent of operator insertion positions. Okay, so you have a topological chiral ring, okay some properties of the ring. The point is that the ring structure is preserved. Okay, this part, the check. Okay, so those operators you saw earlier on, 
they have interpret in, an interpretation in terms of, of this check homology classes. So the number of psi i bar, psi j bar, psi k bar, yeah, that will be the number here. Okay, and I've labeled it QR because those fields have Q charge one each. So you have n number of fields, you have n here. That Q charge is a U1 R charge, okay? Then these guys here, now that's made up of the A's and the phi's. Okay, yeah. The, yeah. The, the mm. gauge, you said it was a gauge field. That's right. Oh, it just so happens to, to, to be a symmetry of the Lagrangian. So in that sense, going to the quantum theory, we want it to be, to obey the same kind of rules as the classical theory. We don't necessarily have to, yeah. But uh, yeah, because it was in, the Lagrangian was invariant under those transformations. So as a stricter rule, uh, we want to impose that also at the quantum level. Yeah. And you will see that when we do that, when we actually do that, we will get the connections to the twisted color differential operators. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So, and so these guys are like the phi's and the, the a's, okay? So you can do an analysis, I, I, won't, I won't go through this. It's a simple, quite straightforward mathematically, check homology. Essentially, you have this analysis for H1, okay? And then you can see a correspondence between this guy here and um, the operators which have one uh, value of psi, okay? The slides, you can have it afterwards, you know? Um, yeah, but I won't go through this in the interest of time. I thought I had a lot of time, but you know, I'm running out of time. I have 18 minutes more. How's everyone doing so far? Exhausted? Okay, so, right, okay, so, yeah, please bear with me. Uh, okay, so now, this chiral algebra and this uh, chiral differential operators. So as I said, that's defined on a local patch in target space. So we will take the sigma model, which is defined on the local patch of the target space. What happens then? Christopher connection disappears because it's flat, okay, and then you end up getting uh, a Lagrangian that looks like that on a local part, local part of target space. This is still defined on all of sigma. Okay, it's just local on target space. Okay, and then if we rewrite this field as beta, okay, the spin one field, and gamma i, uh, phi i is gamma i, then you can see from the propagators here. Uh, yes? Previously, you had covariant derivatives. With yeah, it's all written outside here. Yeah, I know, but why, why aren't there terms in the first order in A? Got from the cross term. Oh, they're integrated out. Oh, for that matter, in, in the, in, in, in the uh, kinetic term for the size. I'm to the terms linear in A. The terms linear in A? Uh, well, there's, there's no field strength. There's no field strength, okay? No, I'm just, you previously, you're not just rewriting the previous Lagrangian. That had terms. Right, 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 right. So, so, right, right. We're using some equations of motion to, to, to get rid of the other fields. The details on the paper we can discuss. Oh, yeah, right, yeah. Okay, so the details on the paper we can discuss. Uh, but yeah, the point is that there are some equations of motion that I used, you know, to get this, this form. Okay. Right, yes, that's correct, yeah. Okay, so, so we have this. Okay, and you can see from the OPEs here that they obey this. Okay, and so we can rewrite those things that we saw earlier on, the operators here, okay, in terms of the betas and the gammas. Okay, and if you look at, you know, and then we can just rewrite this guy here, okay, in terms of the betas and gammas also. So this defines, you know, in some sense, a perturbed beta gamma system. Okay, you have this perturbation here, this, this deformation term here. Okay, so now, gluing the sheaves. So on each patch of X, we have these color algebras, beta gamma system, we want to glue them. So we've got to glue them in two ways. We've got to glue them geometrically, because you need to glue each patch of X to the next patch. And we've got to glue them quantum field theoretically. You've got to glue the sigma model, you know, the 2D sigma model to the next 2D sigma model on the other patch. So to glue them geometrically, you just need to use a conformal, you just need to use a, find a dimension one current, 
which involves the vector fields that generates the GR symmetry. Okay, and a, a clear choice would be this. And then you define the charge to be this, do the OPEs of this guy, and do take the residue to find the transformation of this charge here on this guy, you find that it goes like this. And then for the beta, beta fields, it goes like this. That's correct. So this it's a coordinate of the target space, so the change of the coordinates will be given by the vector field. And then this is a tangent vector on the target space, and then it should transform in this way. Okay. Now, to glue them quantum field theoretically, you got to use a current which is associated to the moduli of the sigma model, which is something that I didn't uh, show explicitly. But you can construct, you can show that the sigma model uh, depends, can be controlled, you know, with a using a, a, a one form, okay, of the target space. And so we want to use this one form with some features, okay, some features, some geometrical features, and construct a dimension one current again using this one form, okay, and then whose charge is this, and you can see there are two parts, there's an A sitting inside here, so there, there are two parts, okay, if then you act this thing on the fields, and then you get this. Now notice that it acts trivially on the gamma because it's all gamma inside here. Gamma, gamma, uh, OPE is regular. If you take the residue, that's just zero. Okay, so then you have these transformations. Now, you put all of them together. Okay, then you can write it as this. And, okay, so you can write it as this. So it transforms in, in this way. Okay. Okay, good. Now, let's see the connection to the physics. So let's consider the case where we have a flag manifold of SU2 or SL2C, which is a sphere, CP1. And on one patch of the target space, we can write down the stress tensor of the beta gamma system as this. And on the other patch of the target space, okay, we can write this as T tilde. So remember, we had the rules, right, to go from one patch to the other, from one non tilde to the tilde, right? So we do that, okay, we do that, we put the fields, this one here, the tilde ones, we put it in terms of the non tilde ones. And then you compute that, you know, they're not the same. There's this quantity here. Okay? So if you look at the global sigma model, its stress tensor looks like this. So the point is that it does not contain a psi field, which then means that it should be a class in the global section of this sheaf of chiral algebras, because the count of the Q is zero. Which then means that by right, over in the sections, they should be the same. T tilde should be T C. But it's not. It's given by this obstruction here. And in the physical model, we saw earlier on that we had this thing here. Okay, so you can see that we have a very nice sort of holomorphic way or chiral differential operator kind of way to understand, a shift theoretic kind of way to understand this relationship. Can you see that? So there's a one-to-one -one kind of thing going on. Okay, so like this term here, and then this term here. Okay, so this is sort of the connection to the physics, how something abstract like sheaf cohomology, check cohomology of these chiral algebras can actually sort of make, con make contact with uh, the physics of, of anomalies. So on this slide, hmm. Z, Z is a coordinate on X, or? This term, no, oh, Riemann surface. It's on the Riemann Always Riemann surface. Mm. Oh, and when you said the global sigma model, Global as in all of X. Yeah. See, at any point, the sigma model, the Riemann surface is, is still the entire thing. It's just that the target is local. So that's why you see in the formulation here, we still write it as, uh, uh, sorry, sigma. Yeah. Okay. So it's just that the target space is local. And you are gluing over the target space. Although the operators are locally inserted on the Riemann surface, but the Riemann surface is always the entire thing itself. Okay, All right. Okay. So, okay, so we saw this. Now we could rewrite these things into this form, okay? So why do I write it in this, this uh, complicated looking form? It's just to make contact with the exact formulas in 
the paper by Arakawa and uh, Malikov and uh, Scheinman. Okay, so the point is this. This TW here just says it's the twisted, the transformation of the twisted color description operator. The non-TW is just telling you the transformations of the non-twisted one, the original one that you know Witten worked on. Okay, and if we look at our transformations, we have sort of this relationship. Now, this is exactly the relationship that Harakawa et al. derived, you know, or constructed, or defined in their twisted current differential operator. So that means our beta gamma system that's perturbed by this AV thing that describes the the chiral algebra, the sheaf of chiral, twisted current differential operators that Arakawa and uh, and friends have defined. Okay, so we have made contact with that now. Okay. All right, so, and then same thing, we can do the gluing, use uh, group cohomology and all that, and find that the obstruction is given by this. Okay, and this is just the T equivalent first boundary argument class. Uh, and that's exactly what we should have in the physical model. Okay, that this sigma model on a flag has this, 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 this obstruction to, to, to being well defined. Okay, so, of course, that was what we showed just now was in the simple case of CP1. We could do this for, you know, higher G flag manifolds, okay, right? Okay, and, but the point is this, okay, so on each patch we have this, okay, on the intersecting patch we have this, so this is just the, dim this is just the dimension of the sub, the sub algebra or the Lie algebra of upper triangular nilpotent sub uh, matrices because you're using a Cartan decomposition of the complex gauge group, okay? So the flag manifold would be that dimension, okay? Because it's G mod B, okay? So, and then we find that we also have these currents. Now these are dimension one currents, the affine currents. You see in a topological model, you cannot have dimension one currents as, as part of the chiral algebra because in a topological model, you can only have ground state or conformal dimension zero observables. You can't have a conformal dimension one observable. But in this case, we can, and if you look at the global sections of this, this, this formulation now, and they are global sections because this is zero, and because if you look at the currents, they don't contain the psi fields, it's all bosonic fields, okay? Now then, they, they furnish an affine algebra. Now the interesting thing is that this OPE of these guys here, when the target is a flag manifold, it will be at critical level. Level K equals to minus HV. HV is the dual coxeter number. So that's what we need. Okay, that's what we need. Okay, so, and of course, we can also construct composites of these fields, which will also be in the Q cohomology, okay, because each Q will annihilate each of the J, okay. And from a Seeger Sugawa construction, we know that we can write SI as K plus HV. But now this is the tricky part, or rather the interesting part. Okay, so recall that we have an affine algebra at critical level, which means that K equals to minus HV. Right? Which then means that if you look at this expression, it's zero. Okay, but this expression is a quantum definition of this guy. So how do we interpret this? Okay, so it means that this guy here, this Siegel Sugawa uh, operator, it does not exist as a quantum operator. Okay, and the quantum level is transformations on any field is zero. Okay, so it is a purely classical object and ought to be generated by the non-dynamical gauge field A because that's this guy is just a background field with no fluctuations, okay? The point is that the SI generates a constant multiple of the transformations associated with the, okay? So it's like K plus HV of the transformations that, uh, that this guy effects, okay? Just a, a skilled version of the transformations associated with the stress tensor, okay? But now we see that zero, but this is reflective of the fact that, if you remember, that for flag manifold, QTZZ was not zero. So it was not in the Q cohomology. So that's consistent. Okay, it vanishes in the Q cohomology. So it's consistent. Okay, but that's what we need actually. That's why back to the point where Jacques was asking just now, uh, it's anomalous, but exactly because we want it to be anomalous in that sense. Okay, this, we want this thing here. Okay. So explicitly, you have some computations where I can show you that this is true. So you can compute that if G equals to SL2, you have all these A's inside here, SL3, and this. 
you know, and more and more, okay? And the point is that since these are Pascal fields with trivial OPEs, they commute with everything else, okay? They commute with themselves, commute with the currents. So it means that we can identify these S's here with the center of the current algebra generated by the currents, and it's Z derivatives. I'm confused. Mm. Um, if I have some function of the classical field, mm -hmm. I don't interpret that as the zero operator in the quantum theory. I interpret that as a multiple of the identity operator in the quantum theory. Right, right. But you see, you. Combination of classical fields times the identity operator. Mm. So I, you're, I didn't understand that previous. Uh, it, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. So, so the point is this. Okay, so, so, so this guy here, it generates K plus HV of the transformations affected here, right? So, so, so on the right hand side, we have, so on the left hand side, what I claim is, I mean, what you say at the bottom is correct, is uh, some function of the classical fields mm -hmm. times the identity operator in the quantum field. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they have an equal sign. Mm -hmm. And then, then on the other side, I have something that you say is zero. Yeah, yeah. So what it means is that, you see, no, no, no. So, so it means this, it means this. It means that the action of this guy on any quantum field, the action, okay, vanishes because... The identity yeah, operator commutes with everything. So yeah. Uh, I mean, if you just mean in the sense of commutator, then true, the identity operator commutes with everything. Right, so, so, so in terms of the, the background fields, which are holomorphic functions, which on a Riemann surface can be constants, that's how we interpret this guy. You're right, you're right. So in the commutator, this is the identity operator, you're right, yeah. So if I, if I put, you know, the uh, mm. commutator mm -hmm, mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. God, Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. on both sides. Mm -hmm. Then I'm perfectly happy. That's right. It's supposed to be interpreted in that way. But it's not not, not as an operator equation. Right, right, right. Yes, yes. But it's it's supposed to be interpreted in that way with the commutator. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, all right. So then you have this here. Okay. Three minutes. Okay, and then. Recall that we had this earlier on. I mentioned that when you take the limit of the sigma model to infinity in the target space infinite volume limit, and you shrink it down to a finite volume, we have this. Now, this guy here, okay, right? So it's essentially this one. Now, this guy here is essentially this thing here. So this is sort of the equation that Berlinson and Drinfeld used you know, to formulate their version of geometric Langlands using car algebras. And we have it, you know, in the physical theory here. Okay, so I'm left with two minutes. Okay, let me just continue. So, the point is that, remember we had these J currents and the A's were inside, and these A's belong to the S, and these S were from these guys, which means that we have a set of J currents which are controlled by these things. This is a function on the space of opus. Um, okay, by LG, okay, LG now, okay, that's one thing. Now we have these J currents on the world sheet, with zero modes obey this Lie algebra, from which we can exponentiate these J currents, to give a G bundle over the world sheet, and since this, this, the, uh, these are J currents are holomorphic, we have a holomorphic bundle on the world sheet. Okay, so, oops, sorry, right. And then, if you look at the J currents acting on some, you know, primary field operator of highest weight zero, it transforms in this way. So if you look at a correlation function and try to see how it varies as you vary the bundle that's being generated by the J, you see that it takes this form, which then means that over the moduli space of G bundles, you actually can define you know, a sheaf of correlation functions, okay? And so, take the G equals to SL2 case, you can see that the J's act on the primary fields as differential operators, okay? And, and you can see that there are these parameters here, you know, differential operators in X, 
This is not a coordinate on the Riemann surface, it's something else, it's a different parameter. And so we can rewrite the correlation functions as things which depend on the insertion points and these other parameters. Okay, and these parameters, since we have a sheaf of correlation functions on bungee, we can take these parameters to parameterize, you know, the positions in bungee. Okay. And SZ, which is second order in second order in the J's, okay, would mean that they are second order in the differential operators here. Okay, so, so essentially we have something like this. Okay, so this is where the S acts on this guy. And, and then it gives you a constant value, basically, which is the degree SI differential on sigma. Okay, so now, now these SIs, these S, S's, okay, if you see how they transform as over, over different points in Bungie, you can see that, you know, since the OPE is trivial here, it is constant over uh, Bungie, okay? And they also commutes with each other, as we explained earlier on. And the dimension of these Siga Sugawa operators, the number, number, independent number of them, is exactly the same as the dimension of Wanji. Okay, which means that those correlation functions and the differential equations that they obey is they are holonomic. Okay. And recall that we had this isomorphism, which then tells us that we have a map from this thing here to the differential operator that S defines. And again, finally, recall that we had a family of J currents from which we, which were parameterized by LG opus on bundles of sigma, from which we could define the correlation functions. So in turn, it means that every realization of this conformal correlation function of phi depends on the J's, for, which depends on J's, it depends, it's parameterized by the LG bundle. So those five points that we saw earlier on, okay, that gives you a geometric Langlands correspondence for G. Okay, as uh, formulated by Vincent and Dreamfeld. Okay, I'm done with time, so I, uh, I can't continue the next part. So, uh, well, I'll leave the slides with you guys. If you have any questions, you can ask me, but we'll just look at what's happening here. So you have all these things that are associated with knots. So the point is that you have all these knots cutting some surface here, and the surface here lifts a WZW model, and the sigma model itself, you know, uh, in the infinite volume limit, and when G is simply laced, you can write it in this form, which can be rewritten as a WZW model for compact G. Okay, and then so we have these connections of the conformal blocks and correlation functions with knots. Okay, so with knots. And at the same time, these Correlation functions, okay, if you read the literature on Chen Simon's theory and, and its connections to WCW, there are sections of these things here, which happens to coincide with D modules, okay. And so we can, you know, make use of the interpretation in terms of D modules and connect, you know, Kovanov homology, which is on the north side with these things that intersect, D modules that intersect, but we also know that there is a connection with Lagrangian submanifolds on the modular space of Higgins equations. And so that's where we can connect with Seidel and Smith's result. Okay, seeing this analog, okay, we can interpret this part here as this intersection, Lagrangian, Lagrangian intersection flow homology, and then feed it back, you know, to this part here. Okay, and that's Seidel and Smith's conjecture. We could do it for links. So we could do it for links too, not just knots, but also links. For links, then you need something more complicated here. So we have like n, n minus one links, and each link itself is in some representation j, highest weight representation j of the gauge group. And then we have, you know, when we specialize the g equals su2, again, we get Kovanov homology on this side, and then something which involves like some d modules, and then this transformation. So this is the generalization of Seidel and Smith's results to arbitrary links. Okay, so this is, this is, this is, this is, I, I don't think this has been sort of uh, done anyway. Okay, so I've come to the end of a very long talk. All right, in conclusion, there's a nice interplay between physics and math, as you can see. So the physical interpretation provides a novel way of looking at the mathematical results and proving the conjectures 
and connects seemingly unrelated areas of math via the physics. So four-dimensional, the punchline is that four-dimensional gauge theory is not the only physical manifestation of the geometric Langlands correspondence. Thank you for your attention. Uh, could you highlight the role of the gauge field in whatever you did? Sorry? The gauge field on the world sheet? Yes, that's right. You said it's non-dynamical. Yes, right. Uh, could you just highlight the role it played in... Uh, oh, yes, yes. Describe. You see, once you add the, well, the, the A inside, then you would have these S's, S we saw just now, which were constructed out of these A's. Yeah, so, and that's what we wanted. We wanted an S that is made out of fuse A, you know, which have some, which can act as some kind of parameter, a classical kind of parameter. Yeah, non-fluctuating parameter, non-quantum fluctuating field, basically. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. If we gauge it, then it changes everything. Because, I mean, if we, if we have a dynamically gauged system where you have the field strength and all that, then your BPS equations and a lot of things will be different, and it's not, it's, it's interesting, of course, still, you know, just that it won't, be useful for our purpose of making connections to those things that we wanted to do. Yeah. Other questions? So, okay, I, I had a question. So, sure. how did G dual enter your picture? Like for Kapustin Witten, mm -hmm. that had the nice explanation that that was related to S duality, right? Mm -hmm. So, but you were studying a zero mm -hmm. two model. Yes, yes. Some flag manifold. Yes, yes. Right? So how does G do Yeah, so that, okay, that, when I say generalized T-duality, I don't mean generalized in the sense of generalized geometry, because there were people who studied generalized geometry and T-duality. So I didn't show the details, it's in the paper, but the point is that the sigma model, okay, has two target spaces. So because of the A's and the V's that you saw, and the index of the A and the B, the Lie algebra index, so there's an abstract Lie algebra space, a flat one, basically. Okay, whereby you could compute the Hamiltonian for the sigma model and show that it obeys or it enjoys a, a, a generalized kind of t-duality whereby the Hamiltonian is invariant when you do some inversion of some parameters which are geometrical and non-geometrical. Yeah, it gives us the isomorphism of the W algebras. Yes. So, okay, essentially what it means is this. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a sigma model whose whose data is not just the target space X, it has the Lie algebra data, uh, Lie algebra index also. So for example, heterotic strings, right? So if you look at the left moving fermions for heterotic strings, it's like lambda and then you have an A, you know, so then you can, you can think of the fermion fields as being valued in the Lie algebra lattice, yeah. Same kind of thing going on, yeah. How, how does the two of Lie algebra Right, right. So when you do the t-dual thing, the t-duality, you have to exchange the roots with the co-roots. That's the point. And that's where the dual part comes in. Yeah, the t-duality, okay, that exists in the model, okay, it's not just, okay, so not just the geometrical R1 over R1, that will switch the levels. The part which the group switches is that you see in the expression there are roots and co-roots, that you can also swap. That's where the Langlands dual group comes from. And so, as far as I know, the W algebra duality is sort of sensitive just to the Lie algebra G. Mm -hmm. In your setup, are you really sensitive to the group, like this pi one or the center of the group matter for you? No. It's, so it's just it's just like okay. So if you look at the W algebra, okay. And they are generated by the Sigas uh, SS operators, the SS fields, right? And those are just composite fields of the, the J's, right? And so, so it's just that. So we have the J's. Once we have the J's, that's the basic ingredient that you can use to sort of construct, you know, composites of J's which are still in the Q cohomology, which are then, you know, one to one correspondence with the W algebra generators. Yeah. There are several ways in which you can get the W algebra. There's a Dreamfeld Sokolov reduction. You know, which you start with an affine algebra and then you mod it out by, you know, it's a Borel subgroup, okay? Uh, sorry, the Newpotent subgroup, the upper triangular, the, the N plus in the formulation of uh, complex Lie groups, okay, the Cartan decomposition. 
So that you can do that one way. And another way is to have these affine currents and put them together to construct these higher spin you know, uh, generators of the W algebra. Yeah, so there are several ways in which you can realize them. Yeah. I don't see any further hand, so let's thank the speaker again. All right.